Ha, we're live. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome. Don't know if anybody's here yet. Oh, wait, hang on. I do one thing real quick. There we go. Now I can actually see what I'm doing. <clears throat> so as you can see, we're going to do a male figure drawing. And uh, I don't have a ton of time today, so I'm going to try to keep it uh, like around an hour, hour and a half maybe, just so everybody knows. And uh, yeah, that's the plan. So... Zoom out here a little bit. There we go. Usually at the start of these things, I just kind of show some stuff on my pad for a few minutes while I wait for people to show up. Good morning and good evening, depending on where you are. So we'll start with that, right? So you can kind of see some stuff that I've been doing for demos over this last week or so, starting with this, right? I've got like this kind of Bridgman, I'm teaching a Bridgman class. And so like most of the demos so far have been demos of Bridgman drawings. Let's see if I can find an example here like this, right? Like a Bridgman leg, you know, Bridgman leg. And there was one week where I did just Bridgman legs, knees, you know, back of the knee, stuff like that. And then the last two weeks of the class, what I'm doing is I'm trying to do my own figure drawings from our reference, but try to inject some of the information that I'm learning from Bridgman into my own drawings is kind of the idea. And this was my first attempt at doing that. I've actually never tried to do this before. Maybe it's not great to do a demo where I, I've never done it before, but this was it. You know, so I was taking some of that Bridgman design a little bit and trying to like kind of inject it back into my my own work. This was kind of the result. Um, some of it, like you can kind of see, it's it's a matter of like the direction that I'm pushing some of these lines. It's kind of the opposite of how I would normally do it, right? Like normally this would be a curve and then, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but as opposed to one curve and then like a more subtle one, it's kind of like an opposing curve this way. Same thing here, it's coming this way and then boom, cutting back, which is something you see Bridgman do a lot. So I was trying to see if I can kind of do that a little bit in my own drawing. You can see it like right in here. And then on top of that, I tried to just add some little like Bridgman lines to this leg. That was kind of the idea. And you know, got one of these. Let's see, oh, I guess that was it. You know, I've got something from our structural figure drawing class. You can see a anatomical figure, essentially. Where we're just kind of going over all the anatomy and in that class we're at the point where we're just kind of like taking everything we learned the first three weeks and then just kind of bringing it all together into a uh, Oh, I meant to finish this one. That was from the head tilt class. And then I've got something from the foreshortening class, which maybe I cannot show on YouTube. How about this? Let's try it that way. You know, from the foreshortening class. So you have to draw really foreshortened poses. And uh, it's a fun class. It was very interesting. Challenging to teach, but rewarding because the, the drawings always end up really cool. You know, it's the really foreshortened drawings that end up looking the coolest. You know, and then some Bridgman torsos. So that's kind of what I've been working on the last week is uh, another Bridgman torso, right? Some stuff from the structural figure drawing class. It was the torso week, the week before. You know, so I've got all sorts of torso things in here. You know, torso from the back, talking about shoulder girdle and how that works. This was cool. I was really happy with this drawing. I thought this turned out really well. This was from the foreshortening class as well. And I was pretty happy with it. I don't know, just in case anybody wanted to see. 
Um, yeah, so head tilt class, right? Head tilted back. And that was the last live stream we did. So I'm guessing everybody's seen everything else in here. So let's go ahead and start on this drawing. Pick my weapon. Freshly sharpened pencil, pretty new eraser, which is really old. So it's kind of crumbly and breaking apart. But usually if you just kind of need them for a while, they will start to work normally again. Also, I've got my delicious Coca-Cola here, which I am also going to drink right now. For brain power. Okay, so here we go. What I'm gonna do first is figure out just a few little measurements real quick on and how to fit this thing on the page, right? So we've got the very top of the pose up here, right? In this case, it's going to be his hand, right? Because it's way up there. It's way above his head. You know, he's got his, his hand up there. Also, notice that the hands look really big, right? The hands look really big, and I'm guessing there's like an element of photographic distortion going on there. And uh, that's pretty common with photos, you know, something you have to learn to watch out for. And let's see if we can get the bottom, right? The feet will be about here. Now, I know that this mark that I just made way up here, that's the top of the hand, which means the head is probably going to be more like here, maybe. And it seems even farther in the reference, but keep in mind... That arm seems pretty big, right? So we might have to shrink it a little bit. I don't know. Either way, I'm going to put the head right there. And then just in case, I've got a little bit of room for error up here as well. So if the hand ends up needing to go a little bit higher, it's not that big of a deal, you know? So top of the head, bottom of the foot, find the halfway point. And keep in mind, this is just for working from reference. And it's really more of like a training technique, right? Because we need to figure out how to train our brain to judge proportion well. And so part of that really is, is just taking the time to break this space up into even spaces, right? As a way of training our brain to recognize, um, you know, where's the halfway point? Do we measure? And... Seems pretty good, right? So there's about our halfway point. And so then I'm gonna measure on the reference and figure out where the halfway point is on the reference between the very bottom of the foot, very top of the head. And then we'll use that to figure out how many head spaces down to the ha that halfway point. And that'll get us off to a pretty good start. So I'm just gonna lean over here and measure real quick. And that halfway point is roughly... A little bit below the pubic bone, I would say. So we're going to have like one, two, three, about four heads down to that point, I think. I'm going to double check here. One. Yeah, I think that's about right. So all we have to do is take this space right here, break that into four chunks. Again, just kind of taking my best guess and then measuring real quick. And going one, two, three. Oh, I was way off. Okay. Shrink that quite a bit. One. Or even a little bit smaller. That should be pretty good. I think that should be a good head size. So that gets us off to a pretty good start, right? That just gives us a few measurements to start with. And then at this point, I'm not going to worry about 
the the side to side halfway point because the whole pose is fairly upright. And yeah, he's got one arm sticking way out to the side, but I feel like if we push the whole pose to the side just to get it centered, it's going to feel a little bit odd because this half of the page is just going to be arm. So I'm just not going to worry about it. I'm just going to let the, that arm kind of be off to the side here. I'm pretty sure it'll still fit. So let's see. We've got head sitting right in here. A little bit of an angle. I'm just going to start with an oval for now, and then we'll come in here and, and refine that as we go, right? So there we go. Starting with that oval for the head. Uh, his neck kind of drops down this way, right? About like that and then kind of cuts back over a little bit like this, right? You can kind of see where it sort of like comes down. We get sternocleidomastoid, right? Which is a muscle on the side of the neck. And then it kind of pops out this way a little bit over to the pit of the neck, which is the uh, clavicular notch. I don't know, however you want to think of it. Basically sitting right down here. There's a number of different names people use for it. Now, just so everybody knows, I don't have a ton of time. I don't think I'm going to have time to finish this thing tonight because I'm way behind on work. And I was in the middle of filming a bunch of critiques and kind of stopped to do this. And uh, I'm going to not be able to finish it, I'm pretty sure, because i got a lot of other stuff I have to do. So this will be probably an hour, maybe hour and a half long, and then that'll be about it. Hopefully that's okay. Okay, so we've got collarbone coming this direction. Right, kind of going this way, and then it's sort of popping up that way. <clears throat> We've got a little bit of the... Just kind of cuts over, and then we see the shoulder popping back up this direction, like this, right? So we kind of get like this shape right in there, and then we get a little bit of trapezius kind of dropping down this way and then cutting over this direction. Oh, Olivia's here. here. She decided to join us. Is this one mine? That is yours, but you gotta turn it on. But the other part's already on. Okay. You gotta hold it down. Oh. Yeah, for a while. And then it should work. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. I will now read a few questions to Brian. Did you read any questions yet? No, I've just been drawn. I can't see that far. I okay. Guess I can, I can. All right. So this is from Gabriel, who says, "Hi Brian. One question: What is the benefit of studying Bridgman?" It's a good question. Uh, Bridgman was really good at designing anatomy. That's really it. I mean, he had a really good, like, a nice design sense. You know. And in a way that, and what I've learned actually, and this goes for almost every artist as I've learned over the years, which is that I don't like everything they do, including Bridgman, which sounds weird because I know everybody's like, oh, Bridgman's the best. But as I was teaching this class, I started realizing like, I don't like the way that he draws torsos very much, you know, like, but the way that he designs arms and legs, they're super cool. And then when he draws torsos, in my opinion, they're not quite as good. Just having an off day that day. I don't know what the deal was, but for some reason that's the case. But for Bridgman, it's mostly about design and how to design anatomy and how to, uh... yeah, that's, that's mostly it. It's mostly an anatomy thing. But what I would say is like, I wouldn't rely on him because it's very cryptic and kind of sloppy and messy. Right, so when you look at these drawings I was doing, right, if I go back here to my Bridgman drawings, if I can find them here. Right, what I'm doing is, uh, somewhere, hang on. Uh -huh. I'm trying to like take them and sort of clean them up a little bit. 
which sounds weird, but his drawings are kind of like a little bit sloppy. And, uh, and they're, they're hard to interpret sometimes, right? So what I'm doing is I'm kind of combining the Bridgman book with another book called, uh, what's it called? Human Anatomy. Oh, The Elements of Form. Wait, no, that's the, like a subtitle. Or is it Human Anatomy for Artists by Elliot Goldfinger, right? So I use that book in conjunction with the Bridgman book. And uh, that, the combination of the two is pretty helpful, right? Because the, the Goldfinger book is very clear. Like it's very, almost like a textbook, you know, type, type drawings. And so what that does then is it gives you the, the ability to look at something in the Bridgman book and be like, what the heck is that? It looks cool, but I have no idea what's going on. And then you go back and look at the other book and say, okay, there's only like two things in that area, right? So that's, Bridgman has to be drawing those two things. And then you can kind of like interpret it and figure out what he was doing and why. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. But that's what I would look to Bridgman for is just design, how he's designing things. The type of line work he's using, these directional strokes. Stuff like that. Got center line coming down this way. Nice little C curve. And let's see, we're gonna have shoulder out here. All right, this arm's coming up this direction. Got this one coming out of this direction. There's another question here for you from Brickman. Ah, Brickman. Which says, Yeah. Hello, Brian and Olivia. When I use proportions, the top half is divided into three parts and the bottom half into two, into two parts. Since it's the easiest proportion system that I know of for invention, do you know of any that are easier? Hang on, what is he doing? He He's... says, when he uses pro proportions, yeah. the top half is divided into three parts and the bottom half in two. Interesting. Why? Well, I don't know. I'm not entirely familiar with that method. Method. The top half. You're talking about the top half, like meaning the torso, or like the entire, including the head. I am assuming he means. There's a I lot of different systems for how to navigate sure. that stuff. Yeah. And what I personally have found over the years is that most of them only work in specific situations, you know, which is to say that usually they work if somebody's standing like straight up, like, and you're looking at them straight on, and then they can divide it up into these different measurements, which is cool until somebody moves and then it breaks down almost immediately. So to me, those types of things are really more about um, kind of learning proportions, you know, and training your brain to recognize proportion, proportion and that kind of thing. And then as soon as like, uh, you know, as soon as somebody moves or that changes, those don't really work anymore, right? Like, especially like I've been teaching this for a shortening class and man, like none of those measurements would work in that class at all. They just couldn't, you know, because everything's totally different all the time. And so I would say don't become too reliant on them. But yeah, there's a number of them out there that'll work. I, it's just not how I learned, I guess. You know, like to me, I don't know, I just kind of learned to to make it look right. I mean, that sounds weird, but... Like I studied the skeleton a number of times. And so I know generally about how big the sternum should be. And I know kind of like how the pec connects to the sternum. And I know how all of that kind of fits together. 
And so the end result is kind of the same regardless of what system you're using. But I don't know, this is my opinion. I don't know if that's a great answer. Okay, so we're gonna get this boxy shape in here. Gonna get the it's not a great boxy shape. There's another question here for you from David okay. who asks how much does it matter to you that the drawing remains proportionally perfect to the reference? He says, sometimes I'm very hard on myself with this. I mean, as far as, you know, being correct in terms of the reference, it's not, it depends on your goal, right? I should say. Like to train, when you're like training and you're like, hey, this is practice and here's my reference, that sort of gives you a goal, right? And so you want to try to hit that goal if you can when you're, you're practicing, you know, and that's going to help train your brain to see proportion properly. And so, you know, if you're just practicing, then yeah, you should be able to hit those proportions reasonably correct. But it's, I would also say that like, it's not actually that important, right? Like as a training tool, yeah, it's good. But if you're like drawing, you know, like an illustration or something and you're, you know, you snap a piece of photo reference real quick of yourself or whatever in some pose, is it important that you match that reference? No, not at all. What's important is that you do a really cool drawing that looks correct. That's important, right? And so like when you're practicing, that's what you're trying to practice is how do we get this to look correct? You know, so if you can do that and not have it look like the reference, then it doesn't matter. That's partly why you want to practice figure invention to a certain extent, even if you're going to be working from reference a lot, is because, you know, like the reference will never match what you need 100% when you start getting into like picture making and illustration and stuff. It just won't because it can't. I mean, I guess it could if you were like really meticulous about posing and stuff, but odds are it's not going to match perfectly. And so you'll need to, you know, change a hand, move it a different direction, raise an arm up, raise it down, you know, make somebody lean forward more. And as soon as that changes, the reference kind of goes out the, the window a little bit, to be honest. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know, like to me, working from reference and trying to match it perfectly is just like a training technique to kind of train your brain to understand when things look right and when they don't. And that's that's pretty much it. That's all it really comes down to. And I happen to teach a lot, so my the way that I draw is, of course, trying to match the reference, but not, not perfectly, right? Like part of what I teach is hopefully that it doesn't really have to match the reference so much as it has to look right. You know, that's the important part. You know, gesture, understanding gesture is super important. Uh, all stuff that we can learn from working with reference. But like, am I, what I'm drawing right now, does it match the reference 100%? Not really. It's probably close. But I can already tell that I'm making the lower leg a little bit longer. I think it's going to be fine. I don't think that's that big of a deal. In fact, it looks a little bit small to me in the photo. So, you know, and then on top of that, there's photographic distortion as well, right? Right, which I kind of mentioned earlier. Like his hand looks gigantic. So do we want that in our drawing? Like a lot of that is probably because of the way the photo was taken. You know, I mean, I know, like I took these photos. So I know that our office is only so big. And if you want less distortion in your photo, you basically have to get farther away and zoom in more. And it kind of like flattens things out. But our office is kind of small, so I could only get back so far, you know. So there is like a little bit of an element of distortion in the photos for that reason. 
But in a way, and again, like as for training purposes, that's kind of good a little bit because it needs to, helps us learn to recognize when that's happening and when it's not and when it needs to be changed and when it doesn't. This other leg right back here. Other foot needs to match up with this one. We get this little negative shape right in here. We gotta make sure that works just right. This foot is very foreshortened, kind of going away from us that. So again, just working out the gesture. We want to stick with gesture except for where we need structure to get to the next gesture. Right, so you can see like, yeah, it's mostly gesture, but I've got a little bit of structure up in here, a little bit in here. You know, and it's, it's kind of like structure that helps glue the gesture together a little bit. All right, this arm's coming out this way. This feels a little bit long, All right? Because it's kind of coming out towards us, so it probably shouldn't be that long. All right, the elbow is going to sit even with kind of like this part of the hip. Yeah, maybe it was okay. Then we get this arm coming out this way. All right, kind of doing that. And then our hand is going to sit kind of up in here, right? Which tells me that the wrist is going to be like here, basically. All right, we're kind of seeing that like boxy shape of the wrist a little bit, but it's at a weird angle. So we're seeing it maybe kind of like that. I need to change this arm a little bit. For right now, I think I'm going to leave it. Come back to it in a minute, right? So this hand is kind of popping out this way and doing some interesting stuff. Kind of sitting out there. We get this other arm going way up here. So it's kind of coming up to about here. And then the gesture, well, let's get the other part on here, right? So the rest of his arm, we can see his elbow sits about even with the, eh, just below the top of his head, maybe. It's roughly around here. So it's basically going to drop down this way. In terms of gesture, right? It's kind of doing this. And then it's kind of cutting up this way. Right, using a straight for the ulna. And then the wrist is going to be kind of like this maybe. So 
It's pretty good. And then this hand, I think, is going to sit like up here somewhere. So now I'm going to get back and just look at the whole thing and see what it looks like. And decide, right, does that hand look way too high? Does it look too big? I think we could pull it back a little bit, maybe. This one seems okay. This one, I think we can change a little bit. I'm just going to pull the wrist back. One thing I'm going to do is look for a little plumb line for the wrist. It kind of lines up with his ear. Yeah, I guess it was kind of in the right spot. Pull that back a little bit. It's kind of sitting up there. I'm not going to worry about hands too much right now. They take a long time. I've never been that fastest hand person. I don't know why. But that seems pretty good, right? So I think we can get into more structure at this point, right? Because we've kind of got it blocked in, or at least in terms of gesture, we've got it kind of laid in pretty well. So we can come in here and start figuring out what's going on, say, with this arm right? Or the torso. Let's do the torso first, right? Because he's, he's got a rib cage in here. We know that. So we know there has to be a rib cage. And it's sitting at an angle and we can see it pushing out this way, right? So he's like leaned back and turning towards us. So this rib cage shape is going to be big, right? I mean, he has a very large rib cage and he's also very short waisted. Right, so it's going to be like up in here. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes when you draw him, <clears throat> in fact, that maybe should be the case now, which is sometimes the oval that I use for the rib cage will overlap with the box because he's so short waisted that those two things will basically either touch each other, they're, which they're pretty close to that right now. You know, and then, of course, we're kind of like looking up at him because he's sort of leaned back a little bit. And we can kind of see where the pec is going to wrap around here. Now, this kind of goes with what you were asking earlier, right? Which is, or somebody was asking, which is like, you know, how do you break this space down? Well, I'm just kind of doing it visually. Like, I kind of know how big the chest should be. And I know, you know, that the rib cage is going to open, you know, down around here, kind of sitting like this way, and this way, you know, so we kind of get our rib cage opening. You know, kind of sitting like that. So it really like pushes out here. And then I'm just kind of looking and just seeing if it feels correct for the most part. And there was a time when I was a student that I did a few exercises, kind of like you were talking about where it's, you know, more proportional breakdowns. Like you have the person standing straight on and you kind of figure out how many heads it is down and how many heads to, to equal the sternum and how many heads you know stuff like that but beyond that I, I don't think i ever did that again you know for the most part once you kind of get a feel for how that works you know i don't think it's something you need to do over and over right we've got this arm coming out towards us right to me what's more helpful is Again, thinking of these things as cylinders. Cylinders and blocky type shapes. Right, so we're kind of getting this part coming out towards us this, this way. A little bit of elbow down here.
right? Kind of like down in there. Uh, we can add oblique, but I already kind of got a little bit of the oblique in here when I was doing the gesture. So we're going to have some oblique, or not oblique, sorry, latissimus here. And then it's kind of compressing against the oblique is what I should have said, right? So then we're getting compression happening in here. So what I could do is I could zoom in here and look at how that compression is happening, which can be helpful, right? It's kind of doing this a little bit. And then it's kind of like doing one of these. And then basically wrapping around and grabbing onto the box right about there. And that works pretty well. I don't know. Sometimes when you try and like copy the way the compression looks, it won't look right. And so you'll have to design it a little bit more. You know, that's a good example of you know, needing to design things so they actually look good as a drawing. Because what looks good in a photo doesn't always look good in a drawing. You think it would, but not always. But we get some compression over here, right? Because he's sort of like turning towards us and leaning a little bit. And then also we've got I don't know kind of this like boxy shape here to the whole thing kind of like that like if we're thinking about structure right there's definitely like a side plane and a front plane here you know if we want to really think of it that way you know and that compression is occurring Kind of like right in between those two like boxy shapes as they kind of tilt back. You know, we can move up here to our upper arm. This is tough. I feel like we're looking up at it a bit here. So I feel like maybe I'm going to do this. This. Right, give it like a cylindrical type shape that we're looking up at. And we're also seeing a little bit of the lat maybe and a little bit of Terry's major, but just a little bit, like right in here. Just ever so slightly. In fact, I should wait to draw that until I draw the pec because that might need to take up that same space. And then we get this arm coming back towards us a little bit, right? So we're going to pick up cylindrical shape around here, here, boxy shape for the wrist. We'll go down and think about the legs a little bit. Legs are interesting. We're kind of looking down at them a little bit, I think. I don't know. Maybe, like, it's hard to tell exactly where the horizon line would be here. I feel like it would be around this area, probably. So maybe we could be looking like this here, and then kind of like, yeah, I think that works okay. And then kind of down at this part. Not like that. I'm not going to worry about the back leg too much because we're not seeing much of it. Basically, yeah, we can add a little bit more structure to the head, maybe. That might be good. Let's see if we can get a better head shape on here. So we're kind of looking up at him. So we're going to have a cranial mass shape. A little bit of a tilt to it. Kind of like that. And then we get the...
side plane of the head. See if we can create a good head shape and then kind of layer the beard on top of it is what my plan is. All right, so we get jaw, we see his ear up here. out there maybe and then we're seeing a little bit of the other ear as well right so he's got a his head's tilted All right so that other ear should sit right over here All right kind of like that You know, and since we're looking up at him, his hairline is going to be basically way up here at the top. So then we've got to figure out our thirds, but like kind of in perspective, since we're looking up at the head. So we'll get kind of like the brow line up here, nose line here maybe, and then the chin way down here. And on him in particular, he has a really big jaw like really big right so it makes sense that we would get these two spaces kind of equal and this bottom one is going to be bigger right like like a chin's length longer than the other ones and then from there we can maybe go in and uh i don't know i don't want to spend too much time on the head but we can find separation of these planes right front plane and side plane separation right kind of like that and then we get the section down here broken into thirds Eye sockets might be good. Sitting on there, something like that. You know, nose kind of coming down this way. Just use like a little triangular shape for the nose. All right, kind of sitting like that. And then that should be enough that we can come in here and add the beard, right? Which is going to be a big part of his likeness.
comes down this way a little bit. that big beard shape down here. It seems pretty good. I think that's enough for now. I mean, we're not trying to bring this thing up to the finish here. So let's look at the whole thing and see if it feels proportional. Well, it feels a little small, maybe. But that's okay. Uh, part of that, I think, is I could just make the beard a lot bigger. Because his beard is pretty big. Okay, it's enough messing with the head. We can make it bigger later. It's not that hard to make bigger. So let's keep moving <clears throat> and uh, see if we can get some anatomy on here and see if we can get this thing worked up into something that makes sense. Okay, so we've got the neck on here, right? We know sternocleidomastoids kind of dropping down into there. We can't see the other one because it's in shadow, but it's basically doing the same Thing, kind of cutting over that way and then we were gonna have uh, let's start with the peck right let's see if we can layer the peck on here all right so it's gonna drop down this way cut over a little bit and it's gonna meet up here with the deltoid right so we know the deltoid is kind of connecting up around here sort of dropping down this way a little bit and doing this. Right, kind of sitting on there like that. Although it feels a little bit wide. I think part of that is because this side's too wide. I think the side I just drew is actually okay. We can shrink this side a little bit. I've got a couple of questions here to read for you. Okay. These are from John Fernandez. Cool. Welcome, John. John says, hi, Brian. When does the next classes start? Uh, that is a good question. And unfortunately, they don't. No, we're going to be like kind of changing things up a bit. And I'm going to be... 
focused more on kind of generating like YouTube videos and that kind of thing. And then we're going to be rolling out some new drawing programs that aren't going to work quite the same way as the classes do right now. They're going to be a little bit different. And we're still kind of working on exactly what that means exactly and kind of like figuring out how it's all going to work. But there's new stuff coming soon and uh, it's going to be really cool. But no, there's going to be, at least probably for the rest of this year, I'm going to teach classes only sporadically, if at all. And uh, we're going to be focused on some, some other stuff. That's, yeah, that's all I've got at the moment. Unless Olivia wants to add something. No, I no. think you said it pretty well. Okay. We've got more information coming about the programs pretty soon, but we're still sort of putting the finishing touches on them and working with our web developers to build them out. So we haven't announced any launch date or anything like that. But the programs, what I can say about the programs is that they are... They basically take what Brian teaches and create a cohesive learning experience that takes you from wherever you're starting from, whether it's beginner, totally beginner level, or maybe, you know, you've been drawing for a little while and are a little foggy on figure drawing and on the fundamentals of head and figure drawing and take you from that starting point to having a solid, complete skill set within about six months. And so they're not like quick programs by any means. They're definitely a commitment, but that's, you know, that's what it takes to build the type of skills that Brian teaches. So we're basically working on taking everything that he's taught and turning it into a very organized and um, complete program that you can work through. And uh, yeah, they're going to be really cool. So um, we're working on that right now. And... We hope to launch that within the next several months, probably like between three to six months that'll be coming. Um, yeah, and then we're going to be focused on a lot more, a lot more free content, mostly YouTube videos, but that's going to be really, really exciting to work on too. So that was a long answer to your question about when do the next classes start. Oh, I'd also like to mention... I don't think Brian mentioned this, but he is going to be doing basically mentorship sessions that will be five weeks long, and they'll be somewhat similar to the five-week class in the sense that there's five weeks of getting engaged feedback from Brian about your drawings and your art, but instead of following a class, it's kind of based on whatever you are working on at the time, so you can turn in any type of drawing um, for feedback and you'll get a weekly critique and uh, so he will be doing some feedback sessions um, so you can get that mentorship and one-on-one -on -one feedback from Brian. Okay so John also asked also I want to ask you what are the difference between the online classes at Watts versus yours? You mentioned that you were a student and an instructor there. Cool. I'll pass that one back to you, Brian. Yeah. I mean, I was an instructor. Well, I did start out as a student and then became an instructor at Watts. And in total, I was there for 10 years maybe and or almost and taught for, I think, maybe seven of those years while I was there. Because I think I've been teaching about 10 years now, so that sounds about right. And... Uh, yeah, I would say it's hard to explain the difference, right? The difference between our program and theirs, because like theirs is similar, but obviously mine is taught by me. And so part of that is just personal preference, I guess, whether you prefer my teaching or theirs, which is a little bit tough because I taught a lot of their online classes. So in a way, I'm kind of competing with myself. It's a little bit awkward. But what I will say is I'm way better at drawing now than I used to be. And it's not like the classes that I filmed for Watts were bad. I mean, they're good classes, but, you know, I mean, that's the way drawing goes is you get better over time. And uh, I got a lot better. 
I'm also better at teaching. I don't know. Like, my classes focus more on, like, fundamentals, I guess. And theirs, I would argue, are a little bit more advanced, especially if you're taking, like, Jeff's classes or something. You know, like, I've stayed focused on fundamentals the entire time I've been teaching, and I've gotten pretty good at it. And uh, I've also gotten really good at teaching. I'm just really good at explaining things. It's really kind of my strong suit and kind of what makes me good at teaching really and to be honest I feel like my drawing skills didn't really catch up with my teaching skills until just this last year or two really and again it's not like the classes I filmed for Watts were bad because they have still have really good explanations I mean I was still good at explaining things back then but I'm just better at it now and also way better at drawing now it's a little bit embarrassing I see those old Watts videos pop up from time to time and again, it's not like they're like totally bad, but it's a little embarrassing. I look back on them and I'm like, dang, that, I wasn't very good at drawing back then. I was good at talking and good at explaining, but not the best at drawing. You know, the whole reason they had me film... And it depends partly on what we're talking about, right? Because like they had two different things for a while. They have like their online school... And then they had streaming classes, <clears throat> which were like two different things. And so the way I teach now is more like the streaming classes, you know, because that was the part that I, I like doing. And uh, it really, I don't know, part of the reason I left was because I wanted to teach those classes the way that I wanted to teach them. And the way I like to teach them is really time consuming. And it requires this being a full time job. You know, because to me, learning online, like like during the pandemic, you know, Watts switched over to teaching like all online. And I realized pretty quickly that teaching online is not the same as teaching in person. They're they're different. Right. Like the way you learn online, the way you uh, are exposed to information online, it's just different. Right. And like you can't show up to class early and ask questions. You can't ask questions during the breaks. You can't ask questions after class. You can't ask questions during the demo, right? Like it's just a totally different experience when you're learning online. And the way they run their online classes is basically the way they run their regular classes, which is fine. I mean, that works to a certain extent, but the way I did it, and I realized pretty quick, like if people want to really get the most out of an online class, it has to be taught differently, which means you have to have longer demos, right? Like just a quick 25 minute demo where you just blow through a full value figure drawing in 25 minutes. That is crazy hard for someone to follow if they're trying to learn online. It's really hard. And so like I started doing longer demos, right? I started shooting like hour long demos where I really slow down and explain everything. And, and it's time consuming, you know, and then I did the same thing for the critique videos, right? When you're doing the critique videos, it's kind of the same deal, right? Like in, in class, yeah, you can get away with doing like a quick, like 10 minute, five minute critique maybe because students can hear other students critiques. They can, again, ask more questions. Like it's a little bit different, but when you're learning online, that's not the case. And so I tend to do really long critique videos, right? Like that are more like in the 20 to 40 minute range, depending on what people need to know. But that is really time consuming. And so the problem is at Watts, like, you know, they're instructors and it's not like they're, they're bad instructors. They're really good instructors, but they're also professional artists that are, you know, illustrators and they have jobs that they have to do that eat up a lot of their time and they don't have time to do like a 40 minute critique per person. They just can't do it, you know, cause it's, it's not possible for them really. And uh, that's kind of the difference is I decided, you know what, I want to focus on um, doing what people need online. Cause I really like teaching. So I wanted to focus on teaching and not, you know, focus so much on trying to be an illustrator that's the main difference, I would say. I mean, 
it really comes down to the, the amount of time I put in, really. And yeah, I mean, part of it is the way that I teach also. I think my strong suit is that I'm just really, you know, I have a, a knack for explaining things. You know, like one time uh, I was taking like an invention class at Watts and Eric was kind of talking about like to be a comic book artist, you just kind of have to have a knack for it, you know, and in a way, it seemed like he was kind of telling me, like, yeah, I didn't really have the knack for being a comic book artist, right? Which is fine. But then I realized after a while, I was like, man, the thing I do have a knack for is explaining things. I'm pretty dang good at it. And uh, I know it's not, you know, like Jeff doesn't bring teachers on board to train them to become competitors, but that was kind of the way it worked out, unfortunately. That seemed to be the thing I was good at. But I certainly enjoyed my time at Watts, and they are some of the best artists I have ever seen in my life. Anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. I was kind of rambling a bit. But that's really it. I mean, that, that's kind of what it comes down to. Is I just run my classes differently, and I run them in a way where it's literally like a more than full-time job for me. Like, this isn't like a part-time thing that I do on the side. So before you started um, what you were saying last, yeah. Yeah. Um, John in the comments here in the chat said that the programs sound really good, and nice. he said that some online programs are lacking on assessing the students' work prior to starting the classes so yeah. they know where to start, and... Um, and he also said that he took the survey. So, oh, um, nice. That's cool. I appreciate yeah. that for sure. Yeah. And in fact, um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to fill out our survey. Um, maybe some other people in the, you know, who are watching, who are in the chat or just watching right now took it. So thank you to everyone who filled that out because it's been fascinating to read the responses and it's been really helpful to us. Um, we basically sent a survey out to all of our email audience that asked a variety of questions about the different challenges that you're facing and, you know, what your goals are and what, you know, what you see in your future with your art and um, what your vision is for your future. And, um, you know, we're basically just trying to learn more, more about you guys and, you know, what it is you need and how we can best help you reach your goals. So... Thanks for filling out that survey, and we actually are doing some face-to-face -face interviews over Google Meet, so if anyone here is interested in that and would like to do an interview with us, where we'll basically just ask you a couple really simple questions about, you know, your art, your goals, and some of the challenges that you might be facing and progressing in your art, um, if that sounds interesting to you, then please send us an email it's info at foundationartschool.com, and uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So that's kind of a process we've been working on for the past week and a half or so. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing, like, there's a bunch of good schools out there that'll teach more advanced stuff. You know, like, I see them all the time. I mean, there's a lot of places that teach advanced picture-making stuff, and really advanced concept art and advanced, you know, but there's not as many things that are geared towards like those initial steps when it comes to learning and learning like fundamental stuff, you know, and figuring out how to get that stuff to work <clears throat> can be really challenging. And that's really what our school is, is geared towards, <clears throat> you know, partly because that's what I'm good at teaching. And also because <clears throat> I've just been fascinated by it for some reason for a long time I don't know why I have a weird obsession with it and uh, yeah so part of it is just understanding that <clears throat> you know what it is that we offer and and hopefully having a realistic 
expectation. And that's part of the other thing is I keep seeing, you know, without naming any names, like, obviously, I own an art school. And so Google is constantly, or not Google, but Instagram is constantly showing me uh, ads for other art schools. A little weird, but that's the way it works. Apparently, they're just constantly showing me stuff. And so I'm always seeing what else is out there. And I'm constantly seeing things that say like, learn to draw in six weeks, learn to draw in 21 days. I hit, they hit me with one the other day that was like, draw masterful portraits in five days or paint, paint them. I think it was like a digital painting thing. And it's just not possible. I'm sorry, but it, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, it would be cool if it did, but we want to try and give people a more realistic idea of what it takes to actually get good at this stuff. And like, a, you know, if you're starting out, spending a good six months to a year focused on fundamentals is a really good way to start. And we'll make that, that other stuff actually more possible, you know? And, uh, Hopefully we will save people the, the trouble of, you know, finding out the hard way that those things aren't all that great. I can't tell exactly what's going on with this arm here. I think it's doing something like that. So just be aware. I mean, if you're just starting out and you see something that tells you that you'll be like professional level painter in just like a few days or weeks, it's just not true. This stuff takes years to master <clears throat> and learn. You know, I mean, I think if you go ask any professional, like how long did it take you to get good enough to do this professionally? They're all going to tell you the same thing. It took years worth of practice, you know? Some people have more time to practice and maybe it took a few less years, but it's still going to be in, in the, the range of, of years and not days or months. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is, you know, and I know I understand that not everybody has time to do that. But then this might not be the best choice for a career path if that's the case. Okay, so we're getting into the abs. Abs are always a challenge, <clears throat> right? So the abs, they actually go run up over the rib cage and then insert down into the pelvis down here, right? So we can kind of find like where the inguinal ligament sits right in here, right? So we have our aces points, which on the box, which are roughly here and here, <clears throat> the abs are gonna connect kind of basically up under the pec, right up under here, you know, and then they're kind of coming out and wrapping around the rib cage. Kind of doing that, same thing here, coming and going over the rib cage and kind of down this way. You know, they're sort of getting, they get pulled up and over it. Abs are super challenging. There's something that took me a long time to get good at, partly just because I neglected them for a long time. For a long time, I was really obsessed with drawing legs. Whatever my weak point is, as a student, I would always just spend a bunch of time studying whatever I was worst at, or like, like you know, my worst area, which in this case... Uh, going the wrong way um at the time was legs and eventually it shifted and went the other direction you know and now i would say i'm better at legs and i realized recently i was like man i need to get better at like the the ab rib cage interaction you know so that's something i've kind of been focused on lately the learning never stops i've been doing this a long time and still i'm learning stuff right so we get the latissimus squished up into here 
right? And then we're seeing just a little bit of serratus. In fact, I'm gonna put a little bit more of it there than I'm actually seeing in the reference because it, it's kind of like, not easy to see. I think the, the lat is being activated in a way where it's, it's bulging out over the serratus, so we're not really seeing it much, but the serratus looks cool. So I'm gonna put it in there and just find a little bit of space for it right there, right? And then we get the uh, oblique, <clears throat> right? Which is gonna be essentially connecting to our serratus up here. Which is gonna be just poking out a little bit right here. And we have to figure out how to design the oblique striations in a way that looks correct and like it's kind of wrapping around the rib cage. And then what we can do is we know that, you know, our oblique is going to connect in here along this ACES point, right? So we're going to have it kind of drop down, it's kind of bulging down this way. Kind of like that. And then of course that kind of connects into a tendinous part of the oblique, which drops right down in here. Right, so now what's interesting is now we have to decide like how do we want to design the oblique and ab connection like where they kind of connect and this is something I've really been focused on lately because there's a lot of different ways to do it if you look at different artists they all do it a little bit different you know and for a long time my tendency was to kind of do this right because that to me feels like it's kind of coming down and like locking onto there but and now over the years I've or not even over the years but just recently I've been thinking like well maybe that's not the best way I mean it's, there's no right or wrong way right they're just all a little bit different so I've been kind of like changing it up a little bit and figuring out how to have things kind of go this way a little bit more. So it's kind of making like an S curve a little bit, you know, like right in here, boom, S, S, S. But then I hit a point where I look at Yoni's uh, oblique and I think, well, his actually kind of does go the other way. So like, I'm never entirely 100%. Like there's no real right or wrong way. It's just more of a personal preference type situation more than anything. You know, and then of course we get our ab separations in here, which are going to sit about here, here, belly button goes underneath there, just sit right about there, and then we just have to go in and kind of design this stuff out and say like, okay, we know we've got top of the abs, kind of doing this a little bit, drop this one a little bit lower, All right, and then it's a matter of just kind of designing this stuff out. in a way that hopefully, logically, makes sense. Wow. 
Yeah. We'll play. I think yeah. we're at about an hour fifteen. Okay. That's cool. I don't have a ton of time tonight, just so everybody knows. I think I'm way behind on filming class stuff at the moment. I was in the middle of filming stuff, and I was like, okay, I'm going to stop. I'll do a live stream, but only for a little bit. You know, and then we get that next chunk of ab in here. And you can see, like, I'm totally designing this out, right? Like, this isn't exactly what I'm seeing up there by any means. They kind of sit in there like that, and then we get a little bit of fat. No offense to Yoni, but just got a little bit. A little bit right here. Push this out a little bit more of an angle. You know, and then we're seeing, if you look really close, which I know you guys can't zoom in on the photo, but I can. And there's a little bit of the oblique showing right in here on the other side. We'll just add a couple little oblique striations over there. Which, I don't know, kind of worked. Maybe. I feel like these could be a little bit taller also. Let's make these a little bigger. a little bit better. So go in there, design it out. All right, it's got a little bit of a crease right in here as well. A little bit of compression happening. Here, and then we get the glute. Coming out that way. Anyway, this might be all we have time for. So I'm trying to like group things together, right? So we have like a flexor group. We're seeing a little bit of the extensor popping out in the back. And then we get kind of our ridge muscles riding right in through there. And then a little bit of the pronator. I like drawing that pronator because it helps show the perspective of the arm and the fact that it's leaning towards us, you know, because we can kind of show how that pronator muscle wraps around our flexors. You know, and really kind of help push that perspective a little bit. 
to show that this is indeed leaning towards us. Also, this boxy shape helps do that as well. I wish I didn't draw the head too small. I'll have to change that later. It happens sometimes. Okay, let's stop messing with those. Let's see here. Don't know if we have time for the legs. So we can kind of see the great trochanter Probably right up around there, roughly. Of course, there's that part as well. And what we can do is start figuring out like, okay, we know where the Aces point is. We know where the Sartorius is kind of running through here. And then we can see a little bit of like adductor or something maybe kind of compressed up into here. It's a tricky leg. So we're going to have vastus lateralis sitting about here, right? And then the medialis about up in here, or sorry, not medialis, rectus femoris here, lateralis out here. Right, and then we're getting a little bit of the medialis out this way, and then knee needs to move up just a little bit. I think I made the legs a little bit long. Right, and then it's a matter of figuring out how all this stuff kind of wedges together, right? So we know we have our hip flexor, right? Our tensor fascia lata up in here. IT band is going to drop down this way and connect to the tibia right about here, right? Because we're kind of seeing the leg almost from the side. Like we're not seeing a lot of that front part of the tibia here. So I would start with this IT band. And kind of get it coming in here, right? So we're going to have tensor fascia lata coming into IT band. Gluteus maximus doing the same thing. Connecting up to IT band this way. The bottom of the IT band runs basically right along the bottom of vastus lateralis. And in this case, we're going to let rectus femoris push vastus lateralis, right? So it's going to be kind of doing this. It's sort of connecting across here. And then the bottom part is running like along the IT band right there. Right, and then we have rectus femoris coming out from right up in here. Pretty much taking up this space. Could say maybe there's a little bit of like a tendon dropping down. And then we're seeing a little bit of vastus medialis pop out over here. over on that side. And then of course we have uh, gluteus medius 
kind of connecting up along here. Tensor fascia lata. Right, and we kind of get gluteus maximus right up around in there. And then we're seeing a little bit of uh, biceps femoris here on the bottom, right? Our hamstring. So we need to kind of figure out what's going on with the knee real quick, right? So we've got like kind of some femur and probably some kneecap showing, right? And then some tibia kind of right down in there, which means the head of the fibula is probably right back around here would be my guess. It's not super clear in the reference, so yeah, I'm going to guess a little bit, but it's probably right around here. Could be back a little farther because, I don't know, it's probably fine, right? And so we're seeing a little bit of that hamstring muscle pop out this way, kind of doing this, and then it turns into tendon and connects right in there. Right, and so we get that tendon kind of dropping here and connecting to head of the fibula. And that looks about right. You know, and then from there we can just kind of add the calf. <clears throat> right, the calf is going to Basically, it's going up and connecting to the back of the head of the femur. So it's kind of like coming out a little bit and then out again. And then it kind of pops back in. So we get gastrocnemius and then soleus. On this side, we're seeing tibialis anterior here, right? So we're getting like a little bit of tibia, and then it's getting overlapped by tibialis anterior, which is kind of going and disappearing around the other side here, because it sort of turns into tendon and sort of like disappears, I don't know, over the other side of the foot, essentially. You know, our ankle. It's gonna sit back here. Then there's some interesting stuff that happens on the side of the leg. It's a bit challenging, actually. I may need to make this a little bit smaller. I got a comment for you here. Okay. This is from Telsius. Telsius. Who says, I've been learning how to draw comics the Marvel way. Ooh, nice. It's cool seeing how they used to draw back then compared to now, especially John Buscema's 70s slash 80s style. Oh, yeah. John, I don't know how to say his name. Buscema, Buscema, Bu, I don't know. but I did my best. However you say his name. <laughs> I don't know. I hear people say it a different way all the time. I really don't know. I used to always say Buscema, and then, and then one time I realized that Steve... Uh, Buscemi is actually pronounced Buscemi, I think. I don't know. And then I was all confused. But he's awesome. I used to study his drawings all the time as a student. They're really good. That guy can really draw. Lower leg is really challenging. It's one of those instances where, you know, earlier I was saying it wasn't really until these last couple of years that I started 
actually getting good at drawing and my ability to teach for a long time was better than my ability to actually draw. And the lower leg is one of those areas I feel like I got better at, but just kind of recently. But we've got tibialis anterior, peroneus longus, and a little bit of gastrocnemius showing back here. And underneath here would be peroneus brevis, I think. But it's not super visible on him. I wouldn't worry about it. And uh, that's pretty much it. I think this is all we have time for. Because I've got to go film more stuff. And I drew a head that's too small, unfortunately. It happens sometimes. I apologize. But I'll fix it before I take a photo of it. So if I post it, uh, you can see the version of it that is not, not too small. Yeah, but that How to Draw the Marvel Way book is really fun. It was one of my first drawing books. And uh, it's really, it's cool. It's a good book. It's a good book and one that I'll probably revisit sometime this year. Take another look at it. Kelsius says in the video version of the book, Stanley yeah. pronounced it boo semi, as in semi truck. Oh, or no. is it Buscemi? semi truck? Oh no, oh, boo semi. No. <laughs> no, I think it's boo semi. <laughs> I think so. Too. That's good. I'm not going to argue with Stan Lee. I mean, if anybody knows how to say that guy's name, it's going to be Stan Lee. I mean, seeing as how they knew each other. So that's good to know. I appreciate that because I've always wondered. I've always wondered and always, I always knew I was saying it wrong, but didn't know what the right way was. One of those kind of situations. And then once you say it wrong enough times, it just starts to sound right. You kind of convince yourself that you're probably right. Okay, so this is the end, unless... Unless I fix this tiny head. But I don't think I have time to do it right now. I might have to do it later. There it goes. Gone. I'm not sure how it, how it happened, really. I measured so carefully. The rest of it turned out pretty cool. Try this again. I hate having this many eraser marks on my drawing, but sometimes it's the way it ends up. That feels better. Before we put too many details on there, so that feels like a better size. I think it's better. I think that's pretty good. Okay, so once again, his hairline's way up here because we're looking up at him a lot. We're going to have... So 
That's pretty good. Interestingly, I feel like the ear can almost stay in the same spot. No, maybe not. Move it up a little bit. I didn't know there was like a <clears throat> a video version of that book. It's pretty cool. Sounds like the type of thing I would like to watch. Perhaps an hour and a half ago. Okay. Almost done. Cool. Just gonna fix his head. Bothers me that it's too big. It's a rookie mistake. Okay, that seems like a better head size. Took a minute, but that's gonna be better for people to see. sloppier but this should read better yeah much better this 
So that is the end. <clears throat> Well, I ended up a little bit thin. I don't know. It's kind of what it looked like in the reference, though. But you never want to be the person that draws something that doesn't look quite right, and then you say, "Yep, yeah, that's what it looks like in the reference." It's not a good reason to have something look wrong. Okay, I'm done for real this time. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. I don't know if there's any more questions or not, but we're out of time. Cool. Goodbye.